In this video, I want to discuss two more orbital hybridization schemes, DSP3 and D2SP3. Now, remember in the first unit when I discussed the octet rule and we discussed a few exceptions to the octet rule, the rationale that I gave for why some orbitals can bypass the, or some atoms can bypass the octet rule was because they have d orbitals that are available that get involved in the bonding. And outside of that involved in the bonding, I really didn't say much else about why there are exceptions to the octet rule. Well, now that we have this framework of orbital hybridization, we can discuss this in a little bit more detail. So let's consider the PCL5 molecule, right? So PCL5 has this, has this shape. Um, I kind of didn't draw its uh, Vesper representation, but yeah, this is a trigonal planar uh, structure in the middle bisected by this linear piece up top, right? It's a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. We need five bonds that form a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. SP3 is not going to do that. SP2 or SP is not going to do that. So clearly we need a different hybridization scheme in order to form this PCL5 molecule. Phosphorus is going to have to orient its orbitals in a way that accommodates this trigonal bipyramidal shape and form five, forms five bonds. So what phosphorus is going to do is adopt the DSP3 hybridization. So by now, if, if you're kind of getting the pattern, that means it's going to take one D orbital, three P orbitals, and the one S orbital, right? So therefore it's going to form five hybrid orbitals, right? These are going to be your DSP3 hybrid orbitals. And that's going to leave us with four unhybridized 3D orbitals, right? So this is going to be the orbital landscape here after hybridization. So you're going to have, you know, the hybridization is going to occur and you're going to have five identical DSP3 orbitals, right? So what is that going to look like, right? So we got phosphorus in the center here. And we got our different hybrid orbitals. Right? So these are going to be DSP3. So phosphorus is going to be DSP3 hybridized. Right. And each one of those is going to interact with the um, with the orbitals on the chlorine. Now, one thing that we should um, should note here is that there is going to be hybridization at the chlorine center. Right. So um, up to this point, we've kind of just had, you know, these uh, these hybrid orbitals interacting with hydrogen 1s orbitals, but chlorine is going to have its own hybridization going on. If you want to determine the hybridization, it's not just bonds that determine the hybridization. It's also lone pairs, right? So each of these lone pairs is going to require a orbital as well, right? So chlorine is actually going to be sp3 hybridized since it needs four orbitals, right? One to accommodate the bond, but also three to accommodate lone pairs, right? So this chlorine is going to be sp3 hybridized, right? You're going to have interactions with chlorine sp3 orbitals. sp3 and sp3 here, right? So all of these uh, phosphorus chlorine bonds are going to be sigma bonds that are formed between overlap of a DSP3 hybrid orbital on phosphorus and a chlorine SP3 orbital, right? So when I said that these atoms can are exceptions to the octet rule because the D orbitals get involved, what I mean by that is that they get involved with the hybridization. They form hybrid orbitals necessary to accommodate these extra bonds from more atoms. And the reason they're able to do that is because this D orbital is energetically close enough to the 3P and the 3S in order to mix with them, right? Um, this wouldn't happen if you're on the second uh, row of the periodic table, right? Uh, this only happens once you get to period three and below where you have these D orbitals that are energetically close enough to get involved in the bonding, right? Okay, so that's DSP3. 
And the last one, the perfect example is again, SF6, right? So SF6 has an octahedral geometry, six bonds that adopt an octahedral geometry. And if we're following this same pattern here, right, we're gonna have some hybridization occur. Hybridize, right? But for if in this case, we need six bonds, right? So DSP3 is not gonna cut it, it's gonna be one bond short. So what's gonna happen is two D orbitals are gonna get involved to form six hybrid orbitals, right? So this is D2 SP3 hybridization, and that's gonna leave behind three unhybridized 3D orbitals, right? Okay, so um, so without drawing the diagram again, right, you kind of get the picture here, right? So this, S at, uh, this sulfur atom is going to be D2 SP3 hybridized. And again, each of these fluorines are gonna have lone pairs around them. So each of these sigma bonds will be an interaction between a sulfur D2 sp3 orbital and a fluorine sp3 orbital, right? That, that form each of these sulfur fluorine bonds. Okay, so those are all of the hybridization schemes that you'll be responsible for. Um, and that kind of really ends our discussion on orbital hybridization. Like I said, just keep in mind that, um, you know, you really, can determine this um, this hybridization scheme that's gonna be employed by how many electron groups are around a particular atom. So that's really similar to our steric number, right? So you can kind of use the general rule of the steric number um, in order to figure out what the hybridization scheme is going to be. If you have a steric number of four, that's gonna be sp3 hybridized, right? So any central atom that has uh, a total steric number of four is gonna employ sp3 hybrid orbitals. If you have a steric number of three, that's gonna be sp2 hybrid orbitals. If you have a steric number of two, that's gonna be sp hybrid orbitals, right? So really just, you know, however many electron groups you have around an atom is gonna determine how many hybrid orbitals you need. So if you got two, sp, three, sp2, four, sp3, right? Since this is four orbitals, three orbitals, two orbitals. Now, if you have a steric number of six, as we do with the sulfur here, right? That's gonna be your D2 sp3. And if you have a steric number of five, that's gonna be D sp3, right? So you can use this as a general way to determine the hybridization at a given atomic center uh, based on its steric number, right? So if you calculate the steric number, adding up the bonded atoms and the lone pairs, you should get an accurate representation of the hybridization at that atomic center.